Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. No, I think you. I'm Camilla Benbo, and I am the dean here of Peabody College at Vanderbilt University. And it is a great pleasure to welcome you to Peabody this morning as we consider the state of research around the labor market for Tennessee school leaders, as well as the effects that school leaders have on teachers and students. As most of you know, this is one strand of the research mission set forth by the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. And we are very proud that this co collaboration between Vanderbilt and the Tennessee Department of Education and its potential to help drive school improvement in our state. It makes me especially happy to welcome back Commissioner Candace McQueen, as well as those of you who are district and school leaders yourself. It's good to have you here, truly. Now, research practice partnerships are not unusual, but they tend to be focused on the relationship between a university and a district. Terra is unique in drawing upon the strengths of the entire state to improve educational practice. We are thrilled to be working with all of you at this kind of scale. And we continue to be excited about our other ventures we've undertaken with the Tennessee Department of Education, such as the Governor's Academy for School Leadership and the recent grant to design a teacher residency program. Efforts like these show that a College of Education working with key partners can apply research expertise in a very grounded and practical way to support states, districts, and schools. I'm hopeful that this morning's discussion will be an example of just that. In closing then, let me thank Candace for her support, we really appreciate it, and Jason Grissom for leading this research, and all of you here for coming. Again, welcome. And now, I'm happy to introduce Erin O'Hara, Tara's Executive Director. Thank you, Dean Bumbo, and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, nice. Thanks. Uh, I had heard there was some traffic on the way in, and, and so I think people, you know, just but liven up, right? Good morning. All right. Um, so thanks um, to Dean Benbow, and uh, I want to echo Dean Benbow's thanks to Commissioner McQueen and the Department of Education. I have uh, a good number of people here from the department this morning um, for the partnership over the last year. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. Um, so we'll start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tennessee Education Research Alliance, what we do. Many of you in this room um, obviously know us well and have done partners, uh, been good partners with us over the last year. And then um, we will have Jason come up and he'll do a presentation um, on his research on school leadership in Tennessee. And then we'll engage in a discussion uh, with a couple of superintendents and a, a principal and the commissioner about what's happening currently around school leadership in Tennessee and really about the implications of the research for practice. And we're gonna have plenty of time for questions, so um, hopefully you all will spend some time actually thinking about the research and what it means to you and what it means for your role and the questions that you have both for Jason and for uh, our other partners during the panel portion. We're also videotaping, so this will be um, online. And so if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it and are interested, um, or as you see things within the research that you're particularly interested in, you can certainly come back to that. So what is the Tennessee Education Research Alliance? A number of you were here in this room when we launched about a year ago. Uh, we are a partnership with the State Department of Education and Peabody. We are focused on the entire state of Tennessee. So as the Dean said, this is some of the things that makes us unique. There are a number of these types of partnerships. They tend to be in school districts and between school districts and universities. Ours focuses on the state as a whole. We are focused on trying to have the research be practice oriented. So that's part of having these types of events with practitioners here and giving people actually, you know, as most of you, know, many of us are in the state policy realm. Um, and having practitioners help us interpret the research is very important. And then having them help us think about how we get that out to them in a way that feels useful. So that's part of the conversation that we'll have here today. And it's something that we want from you all. So as you are thinking through this and you're thinking, um, this is what it might mean for somebody in my type of roles, what it might mean for a superintendent, for 
um, someone at the State Department of Education, for a school leader. We would love for you to give us that type of feedback. You can do that on Twitter. Um, our uh, Twitter handle was at the beginning, but it's 10EdResAlliance. Um, there is a Twitter hashtag here as well. Feel free to, um, to be posting things. Also, you can reach us on email, and that um, is on our website as well. So we'd love to have the actual feedback both today and in the future. We're also um, informed by our broad-based advisory council. So many of you in the room are part of our advisory council, and we appreciate the kind of feedback that we get from people like the uh, Tennessee Organization of School Superintendents, Dale Lynch, and TEA, um, and others that are here as part of our council who help us to think about what this means and how we get the word out. So what have we been doing over the past year? So just a quick set of updates about us. So We've been doing research in a couple of different areas, um, focused on low-performing schools, focused as well on professional learning. As always, we're doing the annual educator survey with the Tennessee Department of Education. Um, and then one of the things that um, we've spent a little bit of time getting into is the idea of, um, of the impact on labor markets and education labor markets in Tennessee, but that's really why we're here today. So we've spent most of our time over the last year focused on low-performing schools, and professional learning. Today we're getting ready to actually formally launch our work on the education labor market. But importantly, what we also do is spend time convening people. So we spend time doing events like this. Um, we spend time getting people together in a room, talking about what does professional learning actually mean, what do we need to know about professional learning, and how do we organize our research agenda based on that. We've also um, gotten engaged with national networks and other organizations that are like Terra so that we can learn from them um, and help move that forward. And really, we spend most of our time with folks from the Department of Education, with folks from our advisory council, talking and thinking about what is the work that we need to do and how do we help to make it relevant in the field. So in the coming year, we'll be focused more on these particular strands uh, of work, the same ones that I've been talking about. Um, and we're going to start uh, in the spring to focus more on the early literacy strand of work that we have as well. And with that, I'm going to introduce to you Jason Grissom, Associate Professor for Policy and Education here at Vanderbilt and Peabody College, and also our incoming Terra Faculty Director. Um, and so very grateful to Jason for his partnership and excited to hear more about this. Again, please, as Jason is presenting, be thinking about the types of questions and things um, that are important for you all in your role and things that you'll want to have us be thinking about as well. So without further ado, we'll get into the research with Jason. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks to you all who um, decided the thing you wanted to kick off your work week with uh, was hearing um, a researcher talk about, uh, about uh, some, some research done uh, uh, actually over about the last three or four years um, that we've been uh, engaging in work around school leadership here at Terra. And we actually have a, a large set of studies that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to peel off a piece of this morning. Um, by way of setting up the panel discussion, which I, uh, I think is, is most likely what uh, all of you will be, uh, you'll be, you'll be more eager um, for that part of the program that we'll get to in just a few minutes. Um, so the first thing I want to start with is the idea that school principles matter. And again, I don't, have to, I don't have to convince a room full of people who are willing to show up first thing on a Monday morning to talk about school principles that that statement is true. And yet what I'm going to spend the first part of the presentation doing is convincing you that that's true. Um, using data that we've collected specifically in this state. Um, so I'm going to show you a bit, at least summarize a bit, about what we're learning um, about the impacts that school leaders have on teachers, uh, students, and schools more generally here across the state of Tennessee. Now I could, you know, I could fill this slide with citations, um, and, and it, it, this statement is one that's very clearly true, um, but I, wanna, I want to convince you um, that there's a lot that we can learn from the information that we collect in this state um, about the role of school leaders um, and, and their impacts. All right. So one of the first problems that you have when you begin to study school leadership is that getting measures of school leadership is challenging. All right. Uh, uh, you stop and think about it. Well, how would you know if a school principal was doing a good job? Um, you can often see that for an individual principal. Right. You might know that about the principal at your child's school, for example. But how do you collect information about school leadership on a systematic basis, particularly over a state the size of Tennessee, in order to be able to say something at scale about school leadership? 
So that's one of the things that we're very fortunate in the state of Tennessee is that we've actually invested a lot in trying to collect multiple measures of, of impacts of educators, including school leaders. So the first of those um, is uh, the, the team system that we have, uh, the, the evaluator, uh, the educator evaluation system, which applies to teachers. And we talk about it a lot in the way that it applies to teachers, but it applies to school administrators as well. Um, and so it has three parts, and, and uh, team is used almost statewide. There are a few districts that use uh, systems. Those systems uh, you know, have, have lots of, of similarities with team, so we can sort of summarize with team here. But they, generally, there are three parts. Two of those parts over here on the left-hand side are, are based on achievement measures, and we're not going to focus too much on those today. What I'm going to focus on more is the part that's in the green, the 50% of, of, uh, of school principals evaluations that come from the qualitative supervisor ratings. Now, those ratings are given to principals by the superintendent or the superintendent's designee using, uh, using a rubric, right, that's pegged to the Tennessee Instructional Leadership Standards. So it is a way of trying to quantify what the effectiveness of the principal's practice is. And we're, we're, I'm going I'm to talk a fair bit about that in just a minute. We have other measures as well. So we, uh, Tara, partners with TDOE to do the Tennessee Educator Survey every year. So we ask questions of the you know, roughly 75,000 teachers across the state um, about, uh, uh, we'll ask them about a lot of things, but one of the things that we ask them about are questions about leadership in their schools. And we can use the feedback that we get from teachers in schools across the state to say something about leadership uh, effectiveness in those schools as well. So we're going to draw a bit on those data. Um, and there are other data as well, but those are going to be the two main data sources that we're going to draw on and that I draw on um, in, in my work on school leadership. Okay, so we're going to focus on what I'm going to call the team rating, all right? So that's that qualitative measure that is uh, the rubric, right? The, the, the rubric-based measure of principal practice that is, uh, that's given to those principals by, again, the superintendent or the superintendent's designee. Now, we could just run forward with me telling you that's a great measure of leadership effectiveness and you should not believe me, right? Because we should not start with just the assumption that that's a great measure, all right? There's all kinds of reasons it might not be. So the first thing I want to convince you of is that actually um, it's not such a bad measure, all right? So uh, that, that's one of actually the first areas of work that we've gotten into at Terra is looking at the, the characteristics of the, the information, the feedback that, that principals uh, get from the administrator evaluation system, all right? So, these supervisors' ratings of principals, we have a lot of data um, that we're able to, to so we can um, take evaluation data and we can link evaluation data to lots of other information about what's going on at schools, in schools. And so we've dug a lot into what the characteristics of those ratings are and how they predict other things that, that we care about. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but just to summarize a bit of what we're learning. Um, about those uh, supervisor ratings that are that 50% of the overall team evaluation for principals in the state of Tennessee. The first thing that's important is that they vary. So uh, this actually is not a trivial finding because one of the things that we worry a lot about with practice ratings is that everybody's great, right? Everybody's effective. Everybody's doing a fantastic job. Well, if everybody is getting very high ratings on something, then it's practically useless as a measure um, uh, for research purposes. Things can't co-vary if they don't vary, right? And so, uh, so uh, we do actually see a fair amount of variation, particularly between the, the three and five. It's a five-point rating scale. And we see lots, of, we see lots of, of variation between three and five in particular. We see less usage of ones and twos. Um, but we see lots of principals uh, who are, are getting ratings that span um, uh, uh, the, other, the other numbers on the scale. So that's a good thing. The second thing is that the ratings are stable over time, and you'd expect that as well. You wouldn't, it, it doesn't pass the sniff test if we see that, that we see that there are lots of principals who this year get a two, and next year they get the, a five, and the next year they get a three, and the next year they get a one. That, that wouldn't, uh, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't expect that those ratings are doing a very good job, but actually when we look at uh, ratings of the same people over time, we see that they are, they're stable. It doesn't mean they don't change at all, but it means they change in predictable ways. Um, and that's important because the rubric has actually changed. Okay, people are being rated a little bit uh, on a, a little bit different set of indicators over time. The administrator evaluation rubric hasn't been the same, um, and yet uh, people's ratings tend to, to be uh, tend to be stable. The third thing is that they're internally consistent, meaning with, uh, people. Uh, it looks to be the case that the raters who are assigning the ratings are are doing a good job of giving a consistent set of ratings. They're not. It doesn't appear they're sort of rating people at random. Okay, I don't think we'd actually expect that that would be going on, but it's not going on, so that's a good thing. 
Um, and then the, the last thing um, is that, it, that the ratings appear to predict other important outcomes, other things that we care about. All right, we've done actually a lot of work here trying to um, look at uh, people's ratings over time and how when their ratings change, can we see evidence that other things in their schools are changing um, at the same time or, or afterward, right? So a suggestion that people who are actually getting high ratings, implementing effective practices, actually are getting better outcomes from their schools. And the answer is they really are, all right? So we, uh, we find uh, lots of evidence that that team rating um, predicts um, higher subsequent TVOS scores, um, higher what we call principal value added, meaning we can look at the impacts that principals are having on test scores over that principal's career and people who are having um, higher impacts, um, uh, not just in the same year that they get the higher rating, but in other years um, are, are also rated better. Oops. Um, we see that people who get higher ratings from their supervisors also get higher uh, feedback in terms of the Tennessee Educator Survey when we ask teachers about you know, questions that are generally of the flavor of how good of a job is their principal in your school doing. Um, and and uh, teachers will tend to say the same thing that the, that the rating says. And also when we look at measures of school climate, which we can get from those surveys as well. So the point is that there's a broad set of outcomes that that rating tends to be useful for predicting. And that's really important as a researcher because now that tells me that I can use that rating as a shorthand for looking at leadership effectiveness when I'm looking at, say, the distribution of effectiveness across the state, which is going to be important for the leadership uh, um, direction that I'm going to be going in just a minute, uh, the, the labor, leadership labor market direction I'm going in just a minute. Um, uh, one other piece of, of uh, or, or one other set of findings about those ratings that we've been learning about um, is that the ratings that principals get are highly correlated across the, the different domains that are measured within the, the team system. Um, in other words, what it, it tends to produce is something like a global measure of leadership effectiveness. So uh, what that means is that principals who score very well on the items related to um, instructional uh, engagement also score well on the items uh, that are in resource uh, management or that are in ethics, et cetera. So if you do well in one area, you tend to do well in the other areas. Um, what that uh, also means is that, that the, the ratings don't necessarily differentiate performance areas well. So as a researcher, they're very useful in terms of getting a summary measure of effectiveness, um, but there's some more work that we need to do, I think, in terms of digging into the ratings and their usefulness for feedback, because it's not clear that they're necessary, necessarily differentiating um, feedback uh, for performance for, for, uh, for principals, as well as we'd like. Okay, but we do see that, uh, that, uh, that principals who perform at a high level get better outcomes um, in their schools over time. And the question is how, right? How do effective principals get higher school performance? And there's a lot of research in education policy and administration that tries to answer that question. And there's lots of different possibilities. So, uh, you know, people engage in high quality instructional leadership, that might lead to teacher improvement, right? Teachers, because I'm getting good feedback and coaching from my principal, for example, um, I'm teaching at a higher level, my kids are learning at a higher level and so forth. Um, it might be about organizational management. So the, the school principal sets up routines within the school that create conditions for learning because the principal does a good job managing the budget, right, and managing the physical space um, and, and um, managing human resources within the school, right? So that's, those are both true, okay? There's lots of evidence from, from other studies, uh, lots and lots of other studies actually to suggest that those things, those pieces are important. One of the piece I want to focus on uh, for, for this, though, is the third line, um, which is the importance of effective principles for recruiting and especially for retaining strong teachers within their schools, um, because we have some new evidence um, on, on this point that I want to share. And the reason that this particular function of school principals is really important is because in Tennessee, uh, somewhere between 17 and 18 percent of teachers turn over each school year, meaning I'm a teacher at school A in the current year, and if you looked back in, in the next year, you'd find I was no longer in that school, okay? Either because I went to another school or I left teaching altogether. Um, and, and, and that's a, a turnover rate that's not so different from the one that we see nationally. Nonetheless, it's, it's a turnover rate that I think we collectively have an interest in lowering, all right? Uh, lots of research that suggests that as, as a general principle, uh, teacher turn, high teacher turnover rates are bad for kids, right? They create school instability, um, et cetera, and there, there, there are uh, lots of reasons why we'd like to have a more stable uh, teacher workforce. 
That said, that doesn't mean that all teacher turnover is bad, right? We've all encountered teachers who would be best in another profession, right? Or who might not be the best fit for a given school. Um, and so we want turnover then to be strategic, all right? So we want turnover um, efforts to really be focused on keeping the highest performers, right? Keeping our high-flying teachers. Maybe we also want uh, turnover efforts to be focused on failing to retain some other teachers who are less effective. All right, and so I'm gonna show you a little bit of evidence about how that's happening uh, and evidence that that's happening for strong leaders here in the state. So uh, this is the, the first of many graphs I'm gonna show you. Um, but this is a, a, um, a simple plot um, that is on the x-axis is team rating. So on the x-axis, you could take uh, you know, that direction as being, um, as you move uh, towards that wall over there, principals who are becoming more effective. The y-axis is the probability, the average turnover rate. You can think of it as an average turnover rate. It's the probability that a teacher turns over. And what you see is that the line is plummeting downward, all right? In other words, as, principals, as the principal in the school gets better, that principal is better able to retain teachers in their school, all right? And it's, and it's a really substantial relationship. Uh, more effective principals retain teachers at much higher rates um, across the state of Tennessee. And that's exactly the line that you would expect to see um, if you thought that leadership mattered for teachers, and clearly it does, right? Um, in, in fact, there are studies elsewhere that suggest that the, that the, um, the impacts of the school principal are, are maybe even the number one factor in uh, retaining a teacher from one year to the next. And we see that that's what appears to be happening in Tennessee schools, right? But that's not the whole story, right? Um, importantly, we find that the reduction in teacher turnover associated with having an effective principal is concentrated among effective teachers. So the story gets even better. All right? And in contrast, less effective teachers are more likely to leave schools with more effective principals. Um, and I can show you that in a couple of graphs as well. This one takes a, will take me one more minute to explain. The x-axis and the y-axis are the same as in the prior one. So as you go across, all right, principals are getting better as you move um, across the x-axis. Um, the the y-axis is showing you the probability of turnover. All right? And what the different lines now are representing are average observation scores for teachers. All right? And those four lines that are down at the bottom, those are the four sets of highest performing teachers. Those are the sets of teachers with the highest observation scores. Um, and what you can see is that those lines are all sloping downward, the same way that the line on the earlier graphic was sloping downward. In other words, for those higher performing teachers, as the principal in their school gets better, the probability that they stay in their school um, is going up, right? Their probability of turnover is lower. But what's really interesting is what's going on with that blue line at the top, all right? That blue line are, that is this, the, about the bottom 5% of teachers in terms of observation scores. Um, and as uh, for those teachers, those teachers who are scoring very low in terms of classroom observation scores, um, as the principal gets better, actually those teachers are much more likely to exit the classroom or exit that school um, than they are to stay. Um, and I would say across, you know, I've, I've been at this uh, 10 or 11 years, that's maybe my favorite graph I ever made. Um, <laughs> and by I made, I should say, Brendan Bartman, who is my uh, PhD student. Um, in any case, uh, I think it's, it's really important, uh, I think, for us to recognize that uh, the, the, the impacts that school leaders have when we talk about the average teacher, okay, that's great that we see that downsloping line for the average teacher, but I think this is uh, even, even uh, a more important story. Um, I also want to emphasize the importance of observation scores here. We've invested a lot in the state of Tennessee in having principals get into classrooms and learn a lot about teacher practice, right? We've made that very systematic. Um, and importantly, we see that that strategic retention pattern only holds for the observation scores, all right? More effective principals are slightly more likely to keep higher value added teachers, but they aren't more likely to move low value added teachers out. Um, and, uh, and, and I can show you that by just reproducing, that's the, that's, the, that's the value added version of the prior graph, all right? Um, and so these are, um, the blue line is teachers who are level one value added. Um, and the green line is, is teachers that are level five. And you can see the level five line is sloping downward. It's just not sloping downward at the same slope that the, uh, that the observation scores were giving you before. And so then what happens when you combine the two, so now this is um, making this extra complicated, right? Um, these are different combinations of teachers who are getting different, different combinations of, of observation scores and growth. The group at the top are all teachers who got low observation scores, but they got different levels of value added. 
all right? Um, and uh, down at the bottom are the sets of teachers who got high observation scores, but also got different combinations of value added. Um, and, and essentially the story is that it, knowing the observation score is what matters, okay? The, knowing the value added score sort of tweaks it, tweaks the story a little bit, but what's really driving that strategic retention pattern is what's going on with observations. And I think we could talk about, maybe we can get to that in the panel in the Q&A, why that would be. I think there are lots of good reasons why we would expect that observations would be driving that pattern um, rather than things that are happening with test score growth. Okay. We also see that, that strategic, re pattern, uh, strategic retention pattern doesn't hold in every kind of school. Um, and I'll point you particularly to the first line, which is that we only see it when the principal continues into the school in the next year. Okay, when the principal leaves, it actually disrupts that pattern. It, it goes away. All right, and I'm just I'm pointing that out because that I think emphasizes the importance of principal stability as well. When the principal stays in the school and when the principal owns the school over a long time period, that creates the space for the principal to be strategic. Um, in, in these uh, important areas of, of, of uh, sort of managing teachers in their schools, all right? Um, also, it's more apparent in the highest achieving schools, so the schools that, have, uh, that has, have the highest achievement levels have these strategic retention patterns much more. Um, and when I've talked to principals in the past, you know, principals of, of schools that are, you know, might have staffing challenges because in, that are very closely connected to being lower achieving will say, well, you know, it's a lot harder for me to find uh, teachers to replace low performing teachers in my school um, and, and maybe higher achieving schools have more freedom there. But we can talk about that uh, a bit later as well. Okay, the other thing that we've learned from this is that effective principles affect different types of teacher turnover. Um, so low performing teachers are more likely to exit um, the, the Tennessee system altogether um, under a high performing principal, um, or they're more likely to move to another a school in another district, but they're not more likely to move to a, another school in the same district. Um, and I, and I want to point that out because sometimes we worry about what is colloquially called the dance of the lemons, um, that when you have a, a low performing teacher that we just shuffle them around from school to school. The effective principals don't do that. They, they, uh, they tend to move those low performers um, um, at least out of their district and, and actually more often they move them out of the profession altogether. Um, and, and on the other end of the spectrum, the um, high, -performing uh, high performing teachers under an effective principal are less likely to transfer to another school within their district. So they do a better job at sort of keeping their good teachers um, from being poached by their colleagues, uh, maybe as a way to think about it. Okay, so that's all by way of setting up the idea that there are big benefits to effective leadership, all right? Higher test scores, better school climate, um, lower teacher turnover, particularly among um, higher performing teachers and so forth, all right? And so uh, we can see that, certainly we see that nationally and we very clearly see that happening in the data that we have on, on what's going on in Tennessee schools as well, all right? Now, I, and I spent a little time talking about that because I wanna tee up the second discussion, all right? And that is, if there are these big benefits to effective leaders, all right, if effective leaders are really helping to drive what's going on in terms of improvement across schools, then we need to ask the question, are we getting our best principles into the schools that need them most, all right? And that's what I'm gonna spend essentially the remainder of my time on. So, so what we can do, uh, we wanna ask this question of how principles qualifications and how principles effectiveness are distributed by measures of school disadvantage across the state of Tennessee. When I talk about school disadvantage, I'm gonna, uh, we could look at this in different ways. Uh, to make it simple, um, I'm gonna summarize it in two ways. So we're gonna talk about school disadvantage in terms of being schools that have high student poverty, which we can measure by a fraction of kids in a school that are free and reduced price lunch eligible. Um, and we're also gonna look um, at principal characteristics of the lowest achieving schools, and particularly we're gonna contrast the 20% lowest achieving schools in the state um, with other schools, all right? Um, and so now I'm just gonna show you a series essentially of graphs. I'm gonna explain this one um, in a little bit of detail so you get the flavor and then I'm gonna sort of march through the others. They'll be easy to digest because um, the story is gonna be very similar, all right? So what I'm showing you here, that these three different lines are schools of different levels of poverty, low, medium, and high, all right? And uh, the, the, uh, the larger um, bars are just showing you a higher proportion of schools all right, and the header is showing you that this is the fraction of, of schools in the different categories who their principal is in their first year as a principal. In other words, they've never been a principal before. And what we see is that, uh, that principal experience is lower in high poverty schools, and this is just a way of summarizing that. So um, low poverty schools in the state, the fraction of, um, of principals of those schools that are in their very first year as a principal is only 11%. 
but in the highest poverty schools, it's 14%, okay? So three percentage points on an 11 percentage point base is big, right? It's a 25% difference, all right? That's, that's fairly large, all right? So I think every, now you got the flavor of the graph, how this works, all right? So I could move this to just be the first through third year. So this is, these are now, rel, you know, these are novice principals. They're still in their first three years in the profession. And you can see that, uh, that the, the, the pattern maintains. Low poverty schools, 29% of those schools have a, a first through third year principal compared to 40% um, of schools that are the highest poverty. All right, so that's starting to give you a sense that the, where we're gonna go, that the turnover in high poverty schools is higher. Um, we could look at this with achievement instead. So now the bars, instead of dividing it by free and reduced price lunch percentage, are showing you uh, by achievement level, all right? So these uh, on, on the bar that's closest to me are the top 20% of schools in terms of achievement. Um, on the other side are the bottom 20% and then the middle 60% is the one in the middle. And you can see um, that the pattern is even, is even starker when you look at achievement. That in the top 20% of, of, of schools by achievement in the state, only 10% of those schools have a first year principal, whereas 15% of the lowest, uh, the lowest achieving schools have a first year principal. Um, and again, you could do it for first through third year and the pattern would be the same. Importantly, this isn't just an urban phenomenon. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in Tennessee policy is, you know, sometimes we tend to think, oh, that's a Memphis thing or that's a Nashville thing. It turns out that's not the case. So what this graph is showing you, the first, the first set of bars is just that overall pattern. It's the same as, as what I've already showed you. But then we've just broken it out by urban, suburban, and then putting the, the town and rural districts together. Um, and you can see, if anything, the, the pattern is starkest in the, in the town and rural districts, all right? So this is broken down by poverty. Um, but you can see the gradients are the same, all right? Um, it is, it, in terms of the, the qualification measure, this experience measure of your school principal, um, it's systematically much, it's better to be in a low poverty school um, than a high poverty school, regardless of whether you're in an urban area, rural area, uh, and so forth, all right? Um, we could do the same thing by student achievement. Again, uh, not, a, not an urban phenomenon. You see the same patterns um, in the urban districts that you see in the more rural districts. Um, we could also, instead of looking at first year as a principal, we could look at, well, you might have been a principal for, before, but you're new to your school this year, all right? Um, and many, this is just to show you that many principals of disadvantaged schools are new to their schools in a given year. Um, this is uh, poverty on one side, achievement on the other, um, and you can see that, uh, you know, 22% across the state, about 22% of, of uh, schools that we would uh, classify as high poverty have uh, a principal who was not the principal of that school the prior year. Um, and that pattern, uh, you could see uh, um, poverty on this side, again, achievement on that side, and the pattern holds for the urbans, for the suburbans, and for the rurals as well. We could also, we could move away from just qualifications, experiences, and everything, right? We also, as I showed you, we collect this information about team ratings, um, and we could now um, look at the effectiveness of the people in those schools as well, um, and we'd see similar patterns, all right? So again, this, this one is just for poverty, but this is the overall on the left, then the urban, suburban, town, and rural, all right? Where the light green line is low poverty schools, and the dark green line is high poverty schools across the state. Um, and the point is um, the, the low poverty schools have the highest performing principles. And you might say to yourself, well, how big is the difference between a low poverty and a high poverty school? Because I'm showing you this in standard deviation terms um, and that's kind of hard to interpret. But I can tell you that that's about a rating point. That's the difference between a three or a four uh, on average is the difference between the, the high poverty school and the low poverty school on average across the state. Um, and you can see, if anything, when you get to the rurals, it gets even a little bit bigger. Um, we can do this by student achievement. Again, the pattern is the same. This starts to get a bit repetitive. Um, so uh, so the, the sorting patterns are real. They're there, all right? And the thing that we want to uh, no, what thing, the question we want to answer from a policy point of view is, well, what's driving those patterns of sorting? So one possibility is that districts tend to place less qualified or less effective leaders in less advantaged schools. So that would be a placement story. That would be something about um, pipelines and district decision making. Another possibility is that leader turnover is much higher in disadvantaged schools. All right. So why, would turn, why could turnover have a big impact here in terms of thinking about uh, experience and effectiveness? Well, experience is kind of obvious, right? If turnover rates are high, then that means we're constantly replacing an outgoing principal with a less, a less experienced person, all right? 
Um, and what may be less obvious is how turnover could be disruptive to effectiveness. And one of the things that you need to know is that principals get much, much better in their early years in the job. As you can imagine, it's a really tough job. You learn a lot by doing it, right? And so typically when we look at evaluation ratings, the year that the principal does the worst is the first year in the principalship, right? When, when everything is new and it's, it's, it's a, tough, uh, a tough endeavor, all right? But that's how then effectiveness can, uh, is disrupted by turnover. If you're constantly replacing more, relatively more effective people who've already learned on the job with a less effective person who's now just gonna co come in and just have to learn the job all over again, right, then uh, you, will, uh, you will potentially system, you create this churn, right, um, that will uh, create disadvantages for the schools that are losing their principals, all right? So we can investigate those two possibilities. So first on the placement side, it is the case that less, less experienced and effective leaders, um, are, they do tend to be placed um, in less advantaged schools. And in particular, principals with more prior administrative experience, um, particularly experience as an AP, um, when, they, uh, when they now move into a principal job, they tend to move into lower poverty schools, um, into higher achieving schools. It's also the case that leaders with higher prior team ratings, okay, and that's important, prior team ratings, so you were a principal before, or you were an AP before, so now I can see how you were rated in your prior job. Um, uh, people who did, who did better, okay, who are more highly rated in their prior job, they tend to place into lower poverty and into higher achieving schools, all right? Um, and the difference in, the pri in that prior rating, okay, the difference in how that person did in their prior job, uh, between someone coming into a low poverty and a high poverty school is about half a team rating point. So, um, so it, it's, it's substantial, all right? And yet still I'll tell you that the placement story is less of the story than the turnover one, all right? The, turn, the turnover issue, I would say, is the big one, all right? And, and thinking about what to do about leader turnover um, in the state uh, is, is what I kind of want to end us on, all right? So um, this is, these are our principal turnover rates, um, again, broken down by, by those different poverty levels that I was talking about before, by school poverty. The overall is over here uh, closest to me. And this is just showing you that the average turnover rate in high poverty schools is much higher. So the yearly average turnover rate for a low poverty school for principals is 15% compared to 19% for principals in high poverty schools. Again, not, a rural, uh, not an urban phenomenon uh, exclusively. The patterns are um, essentially the same as you go from urban to suburban. Um, and if anything, the difference between low and high poverty schools in the rural districts in terms of tur principal turnover um, is even starker. You could do this by achievement. Again, the pattern is the same. You're all used to this now, so I don't, I don't have to stop and talk about it. But the, the patterns by achievement are the same, again, across the different locales. All right, and so, so what do those patterns tell us? Well, those patterns suggest three things. So the first one is we need to find ways to get better people um, into high need schools, right? We need to really, I think, focus on how we can get uh, more experience and higher achieving principals into the schools that no doubt need them the most. We also need to find ways to keep principals in those schools, and, that, and that's really the key, I think, when we're looking at the turnover information. And so if we're gonna figure out how to keep principals, how we're gonna get those principals uh, to stay in those high need schools, well then we need to know more about, uh, about principal turnover in Tennessee. And so we've been uh, investigating uh, this topic um, a lot, all right, trying to, to, to look at what we can, what we can tell from data um, that we have uh, at Terra um, to say something about what the predictors of principal turnover are. So I'll tell you a few facts about principal turnover. The first thing is, this is not a new phenomenon. This uh, principal turnover rates across the state have been stable for as long as we can measure them in our administrative data. So this is uh, going all the way back to 2002, all right? And you can see that the line, it, it oscillates a little bit from year to year, uh, but it's, it's, it's always uh, somewhere around 18 or 20 percent uh, for principals across the state. Another important thing is that turnover comes in many forms. When principals leave, they can leave for lots of reasons. The turnover rate on average across this, this time frame is 19 percent, but you can see there's lots of different ways, there's lots of different pathways out of the principal's office. Um, about three and a half percent of those of that turn uh, of principals retire in a year, as best we can tell. All right, um, another about three and a half percent exit, but we're not do not appear to have been eligible for retirement. But they they exit the system altogether. Um, but we can also see uh, within district and across district, those are transfers, so people who stay within the principalship but move to other schools. And within district, transfers of principals are, are large. 4% of principals a year move to another, uh, move to another school just within their, their same district. 
Um, and then we, we look at what we could uh, refer to as promotions and demotions. So people who are moving um, into central office being promoted, although not everybody would call that a promotion. I would say that for our superintendents who are sitting here on the front row, right? Um, and, uh, and, and demotions. So people who are moving into other school level um, positions that are not the principalship. So people who are moving into, into AP positions or who are moving, who are moving back into the classrooms, uh, moving back into the classroom. All right, so it comes in, in lots of different forms. Um, but uh, just to point out a couple of things from, from what I've showed you here, um, across district moves are rare in Tennessee. Okay? Principals don't tend to move to other districts. They do it a little bit, but they tend, when principals move, they tend to move within the same district. That's important because that means that districts have, uh, districts actually have a lot of say, right, in transfers of, of people across schools within their same district. Um, certainly more so for leaders than they might have for teachers. Um, these, uh, this thing I'm calling demotions um, are a major component of turnover. We see a large number of people who are moving from principal jobs in one year into AP jobs in another year, for example. Um, and we should think about that and what that means uh, in thinking about turnover. Um, and then finally, you don't get this from this graphic, but this uh, comes from, from uh, just other uh, descriptive work that I could show you, but w won't for time. And that is the median principal in the state of Tennessee stays in his or her school for only four years. 50, in other words, 50% of people by the end of their fourth year um, in, uh, in that school is gone. All right? And that's, 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 that's something we need to think hard about. Um, again, uh, uh, for parallelism, just to show you that principal turnover um, is not an urban phenomenon. Again, we see it, um, this is urban, suburban, town, and rural districts broken apart, and you can see that th those patterns of bars that I showed you on the last graphic are virtually the same, whether we're looking at the, the Shelby counties and the Davidson counties um, of the world or whether we're talking about uh, rural districts. Um, another thing that we can do, though, is we can look at turnover by the effectiveness of, of principals across the state. And it is the case, so this is now, this is the probability of principal turnover on the y-axis. The x-axis here is, are those team ratings. So again, as we march towards that wall, people are getting more, um, are getting more effective. And what you can see is, interestingly, um, when we control for lots of other school level uh, factors, characteristics of the students in the school, um, and, and lots of other things, you get this kind of U-shaped pattern, which I think is, is notable. So um, the, the principals who are the most likely to leave are the least effective ones, okay? But uh, uh, when I say leave, okay, turnover, in that case, are largely exits and demotions. Um, and, and I think there's, a, there's something positive there, all right? When, when principals aren't performing at a high level in the state of Tennessee, they will be more likely to exit the system altogether or for the system to move them into a non-principal position, okay? So that, that's the story on, on this end of the graph. Um, what's interesting is as you move to, to the far end, as you get to the most effective set of principals, we also see that those principals have higher turnover rates. Um, those principals are also slightly more likely to exit, okay, to leave, and maybe, maybe they're more likely to leave because they've got other job opportunities, okay, and, and, th and that's something I think we should think about. And they're also more likely to be promoted. In other words, they're more likely for the central office to, to, to pull them in, to move into district-level leadership positions, and, uh, and maybe one of the things that we could discuss uh, in, the, in, the, in the panel is what the implications for that are. Um, if, if we value high-quality school leadership, do we get more from having those, those best leaders in, in central office. Um, but how could we address principal turnover? Okay, going back to this, this sort of uh, uh, central question that I'm trying to motivate here, how could we think about how we address principal turnover, especially in our highest poverty and lowest achieving schools? Um, well, the first thing I think we have to do is prioritize stability, right? So showing you that lots of turnover is, is turnover within the school district, again, means that school districts have a big role to play, right? They, they have a lot of, uh, they play a big role in decision making about principal placement. Um, and uh, uh, I think we can, when we get to the panel, I think that'll be a main question. How do we think about that? Do we, do, as school districts, should we be prior, prioritizing stability? I would argue yes. That doesn't mean that, the, uh, that principals always need to stay in the same school all the time. And how do you balance uh, potentially uh, different needs there when thinking about principal placement? Um, the second thing is addressing working conditions. So one of the other things that we're doing is, is trying to look at survey data, because the, the Tennessee Educator Survey also asks lots of questions of principals to try to understand, well, what are, the, what are the views and outlooks and perceptions of principals who turn over from year to year? And one of the things that we see from those data pretty clearly are principals that report higher, principals report higher job satisfaction 
in relatively more advantaged schools, um, and those principals are, are also then more likely to stay in those schools. So how can we think about making uh, strategies to make uh, working conditions uh, for principals more positive in those schools um, in order to, to give them incentives to stay? A third thing I think we could think a lot about is principal compensation. Um, across the state, we don't compensate principals very differently um, by characteristics of the schools that they work in, just as an empirical fact. So we can look at salary files um, of principals, and when we do that, we can adjust for principal experience and degree, you know, the kinds of things that would you know, we often think of as being the determinants of educator salaries. And once we do that, we see that the salaries of principals in, uh, in relatively advantaged and disadvantaged schools are practically the same. All right, which suggests that, that that's a potential lever that could be pulled to differentiate compensation, to give principals um, incentives to stay um, in, in the neediest schools, particularly when those principals um, are, are the most effective. All right, so, so to conclude here, um, you know, sort of led with this, uh, you know, the idea that principals, principals matter, and they really do, okay? Um, but it's also one of the hardest jobs in education, arguably is the hardest job in education, right? The level of complexity of things that school principals deal with on a day-to-day -day basis make this a really tough endeavor, all right? Um, and so thinking about how to improve working conditions um, and so forth in order to, to maintain a cadre of stable, talented people in the principal's office, particularly in high-need schools, I think is incredibly important. Um, the other thing I want to say uh, in conclusion is there's a lot more we can know about effective leadership. I'm only just sort of tipping the iceberg here um, uh, in terms of what we can know about the importance of school leadership across the state, about the leadership labor market, and so forth. Um, we, really, we, need, um, we need to know um, a lot about how we can grow and support effective leaders and how we can get those effective leaders, again, into the, the schools that need them most. We're uh, very interested in thinking about that from a research perspective, and so we really are excited for your engagement this morning um, around that set of questions um, and hope that we can uh, maintain uh, your engagement in that set of questions as we uh, dig into that question, uh, those, that set of questions as researchers in, in coming months. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our panelists and then we'll get started. Um, and again, we're trying, we, you know, what we want and is for this to be hopefully an interactive discussion. So I'll ask a couple of questions um, and then we'll open up for questions and comments from, um, from folks in the audience as well. So immediately to my right, we have Dr. Sonia Stewart, who is the executive principal at Pearl Cone Entertainment Magnet High School. Dr. Stewart is in her sixth year at Pearl Cohn uh, and has led and taught at the high school level in both public and private school settings for a number of years. Sonia was named Principal of the Year by both Metro Nashville Public Schools and the Academies of Nashville. Pearl Cohn has received a number of different uh, national local recognitions, including the National School of Excellence by the Coalition of Community Schools, recognized as a model in urban education by the Institute of Urban Schools and featured on Edutopia's Schools That Work series. Dr. Candace McQueen is Commissioner of Education in Tennessee since January of 2015. Prior to that, as all of you know, Dr. McQueen was the Vice President and Dean of the College of Lipscomb University. Dr. McQueen also was a teacher, was awarded multiple awards for both her teaching and curriculum design in a, in a new magnet school, and taught in both public and private elementary schools here in Tennessee and in Texas. Next to Dr. McQueen, we have Dr. Chris Marzak, who is superintendent of schools, interestingly, not director of schools, uh, an important distinction here in Tennessee, for Murray County Public Schools. Since arriving in August 2015, Dr. Marzak has created a systematic, community-created, district-wide improvement plan, launched a school-based instructional coaching initiative, was assistant superintendent previously in Oak Ridge Schools, a district lead principal here in Metro National Public Schools, an elementary principal, an assistant principal, and an elementary teacher in Wilson County and in Metro Nashville Public Schools. Mr. Millard House has come to Tennessee from North Carolina and Tulsa, is director of schools in Clarksville Montgomery County Schools, was previously executive director of New Leaders Charlotte, chief operating officer of the Charlotte Mecklenburg School System in Charlotte, and deputy, super, deputy superintendent with Tulsa Public Schools, also voted Tulsa Schools Principal of the Year, first African-American principal to earn this award. 
Outstanding Administrator of the Year by the Tulsa Area, Alliance of Black School Educators. So an esteemed panel of experienced educators that we have with us, and you all have been previously introduced to Dr. Grissom at the end. So as we get started, and again, I, I, I hope for this to be a good and sort of interactive conversation, I'd love for you all just to, each of you, offer your biggest takeaway. Lots of information that we just heard. What's the thing for you in your role that seems most significant and most salient? Dr. Stern, I'll start with you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jason, for all of that. It was fantastic. Um, I think for, for me, there was a lot of things that were, I think for maybe a lot of us going, yes, I understand that to be true, I understand that to be true. I think one of the things for me that I, I most value was where you um, paused and talked a little bit about the, the feedback cycle for instructional leaders and how the rubric could be used differently to provide differentiated support for leaders. So that was significant for me. And I think the other thing uh, that needs to be talked about or that was important for me is the narrative uh, that we that we use around high performing and low performing schools, that there's a way we can talk about um, what's happening in our schools such that the leaders that are in what we call low performing schools um, might experience a greater job satisfaction simply by a, a change in narrative. Yeah, I would mention two items. I, I've had the privilege of being able to um, engage with this research over the last several months and, and certainly engage with the researcher. And uh, one of the, the big takeaways is how important it is for us to have a conversation about this, not only from a policy perspective, but how we are strategically making decisions at the district perspective. So it's critical that we're elevating this conversation as a state and we create some ways that we can all engage in solutions. I think the, the second takeaway that was an aha moment for me personally when I first saw the, the research was how critical it is for us to look at the ways the principal retains teachers and so how important it is for us to have um, some support structures around our principals to retain them in terms of how we think through strategic compensation because if they are supported, then they are going to support the teachers around them and we're going to keep those highly effective teachers. And so the, the synergy of those two things should not be understated. I think the research really elevated that too. Yes. Yeah, exactly, Dr. McQueen. I, I, I really think there's this, it's, it, the things that, that Dr. Grissom talks about don't happen in isolation. These are all systemically and systematically aligned pieces. And, and personally for me, it's, 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 it's really cool moving from a teacher to an assistant superintendent to, to now to a superintendent because um, I, I'm one of those people that now gets to impact those systemic and systematic ways that we do things that are highly effective, not only for principals in the, in the schools, but also teachers in the classroom. And I'm really excited to talk about some of these things today. But the stuff that Dr. Grissom talked about in his research, to me it was kind of like, a, kind of like a, it, it kind of validated some of the things that I've known and at the same time, it was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. So, so it's, it's really good to see this, this research come to light. And I'm really excited to talk about these things today. And, and just on a little side note, I want to add to your data by hopefully snagging Dr. Stewart to come work in Murray County Public Schools. <laughs> so um, hopefully, hopefully we, can, we can make that grow a little bit more between across districts. Um, Don't be it, part it, of the problem. It, if, if, if you will. I'd be remiss if I didn't give her a business card today. <laughs> so. You have to get to her before I do. <laughs> So first of all, I want to thank Dr. Grissom. Um, I was on the edge of my seat during, during the entire presentation because there was, there was a lot of confirmation, as, uh, as, as Chris just indicated, the idea of going from a teacher to an assistant principal to principal in the, a school that had 99% uh, high poverty. This, this, this data is what I lived uh, as an educator, but everything from rate of reliability and how important that is from a district standpoint, from the idea of finding those specific touch points to ensure that feedback is happening on a consistent basis for leaders in the building. Uh, the idea of multiple pathways is so important in developing that at the district level. Uh, the strategic staffing is something that I'm a believer in and, and that I live. Uh, you have to place the right leaders uh, in the right places uh, given the situation. Uh, those are just a few touch points uh, for me uh, that, uh, that I saw during the research, during the research that, uh, that really hit home. Millard, if you don't mind, just go ahead and expand a little bit more on, on what it is that you, you look at, you think about, as you think about strategic placement of leaders in your, in your system. So I've, I've, I've always been one, and, and, and you have to understand, I, I walked into, into leadership as a 26-year-old principal, uh, really just hopeful to get a job. Uh, and, and just like the research said, I, I walked into the next to lowest per, uh, performing school in the state. 
And uh, for, for me, I think strategic staffing uh, is a must. It, it, it almost should have policy in and around it. I know that's difficult to, uh, to let come out of my mouth and to actually have, have <laughs> to come to fruition at some point, but it's that important to children. When you think about ensuring that the right um, ability, subset of, of, of skills uh, with an individual go into the right building, I think we do ourselves a disservice, especially for our students that are in the highest poverty schools, to not put the best talented individuals that you can find in those buildings. So strategic staffing is something that I, I breathe, I live, it's a must uh, in, uh, in, in education. I think it should be a standard, absolutely. Chris, how do you, how do you implement in your district thinking about which principles go where? So, um, so let me take you back in time a little bit to August 2015. Um, when I first arrived in Murray County Schools as a superintendent, um, I saw some structures and some processes in place that I really wasn't happy with as a, as a former assistant superintendent, as a principal, as a teacher. Um, one of the things that I didn't like is where principals were placed in the organizational chart. Um, we had certain central office supervisors that had never been a principal that were now rating principals on their effectiveness to lead their schools. Um, I saw that as a problem because they were receiving advice tied into their own evaluation, which determined whether or not they kept their job based on people that had never walked in their shoes before. So one of the first things I did with grace from the school board, luckily, which really wasn't received well among some people in central office was, is I moved principals to the top of the organizational chart. So if you look at the Murray County organizational chart right now, it goes superintendent, assistant superintendent, principals, central office supervisors. So central office supervisors now serve as high-level instructional coaches to principals in their buildings. And a principal now has the authority to tell a central office supervisor, we're not going to do that in our building. But then you've got to have reasons to justify why. Because if it doesn't go well, then we have a conversation. You know, why didn't you listen to that, to that expertise? Why didn't you listen to that advice? What do you think you would have done differently? So that was the first thing we did. The second thing we did is principals are no longer placed in schools in Murray County principals interview for positions amongst a panel of professionals. So on a typical principal panel for interview, you'll find the assistant superintendent or the superintendent myself, you'll find another principal in the district at a similar level, you'll find teachers from that school, support staff from that school, which could be an, an executive assistant, it could be an office manager, it could be the custodian. You'll also find parents and you'll also find business community members. And so what happens is this panel of, of, of what I call school experts, because they know the culture of, they, of their school, they know what they need and they know what they don't need, they interview and then make a recommendation for hire. And one of the things I can say to this point after being there for two and a half years, I have honored all panels but about two. And we've had quite a few panels. But what happens is they make a recommendation to me, I meet with the individual people, and then I usually go with the panel recommendation. But what we found is that that kind of gets rid of the, well, why is this person in my building? Why is this person here? Who is this person? What makes him experienced to be, to be our principal in our school? Those, those kind of conversations go away. Not only that, it's, it's really easy to look at the superintendent and go, why'd you put that person in here? And I no longer have to answer those types of questions because I say, well, this is who the panel recommend, recommended to me. I met with them and I went with the panel recommendation. And they're, the, they're doing a good job as principal. Um, so those are kind of the things that, that we've done to, to kind of make it more systemic across the board and also um, gives greater input and greater ownership uh, to the culture of that building. So, Sonia, you've heard from Superintendent 1 and Superintendent 2. Which would you like to choose? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you put me on the line. <laughs> no, I'm just, no but, but really, actually, as for you as a, as a principal, what are the types of things that Central Office does that Get, gets people into the right places, that doesn't? What are the types of things that have encouraged you? You've been in your role six years in a, a high poverty school, in a challenging school. What are the types of things that help you make the decisions both to uh, think about where to go and where to end up staying? So I think it's really important to talk about how we get into the seat that we're in. And so I was um, invited to lead Pearl Cone just a couple months after getting into Vanderbilt, which was really very, very challenging. And I had a really tough decision to make. But I was asked to lead that school because my history has been around high 
uh, poverty schools. And so uh, I had no principal leadership. I had been an assistant principal for three years, but I had no principal leadership. And so you have to think about um, what, it, what is it that called me to that position. I talk a lot about um, leadership values versus leadership behavior. So your question is, is what is it that the district can do? I think it's really important for districts to really be clear about what you value. What, what are the values you want to see in a principal that drive their behaviors? Often when we talk about um, interview, we talk about the skills that someone has. To what extent do I understand instructional leadership? I can be fantastic at instructional leadership on paper, but if I can't execute that relationally with teachers in my building, it's useless. And so really driving at what is it that a person values that actually leads to change in a school. I think it's hard to get at, but I think that needs to be really important in the district decision-making process. Um, I think the other thing about what keeps, you know, the, another part is what kind of support do I get from the district? I have had 17 different supervisors in six years. Mm -hmm. 17 people, and some of them, it's gone back to them. So 17 different shifts, I'll say that. Sometimes somebody will have me for a little while, and they don't have me, and then they have me again. Needless to say, I played college basketball. I had four different coaches that I played for. It's really difficult to develop as a leader when you have such shift in, in supervision. And I think that's really, that's really significant. And what it's forced me to do is be really clear about what my vision is for my organization and to be sort of steadfast in that and bring along my supervisor. So when I think about what Chris has done in his org chart, that would have worked well for me because I felt like we were driving the institution and I need, needed some different levels of support. But but I think the stability of principal supervisors is also really, really critical because each one of them had a different vision about what they thought the work was in my school. And again, at Pearl Cone, we're the highest poverty high school in the city um, with the lowest achievement. And I think it's really important for us to think about what uh, strategic support looks in our different schools. Yeah. So, Candace, listening to what some of the superintendents and principals are talking about, um, as you, and as you've traveled the state and thought about and talked to people about this issue, what are the things that strike you about how placement occurs? And I think to get in a little bit to, uh, to what Miller talked about, are there state levers? And, and then we can have a little more conversation about that. Well, let me be clear, every single school needs an effective principal. But there are some schools that really need stability in terms of leadership at the top to be able to, what the research showed, to retain the most effective teachers. And when we have students who are in high poverty schools with a series of highly effective teachers, you can actually turn the trajectory of that student's academic performance around. So while every single school absolutely needs to have an effective principal. There are schools around our state that we need to pay more attention to in terms of the effectiveness of that principal because of all of the trickle-down effect that occurs from that that ultimately impacts student achievement in a, in a very significant way for the student. So what we um, are, are thinking about and talking about across the state, and quite frankly talking to principals who are in high poverty schools, who are in turnaround school situations, is what are the types of things that you would need to actually stay where you are because you're highly effective and we want you here for the next five years at a minimum what would it take and uh, we're hearing back things that you that might surprise you um, some of it is uh, I'm in a school and we have lots of uh, mental health issues of our students it's a high crime area uh, I need my own support to be able to deal with the variety of challenges that I have to think about every single day. And so um, I've heard everything from I need my own mental health support. Like that would be really beneficial. I have seen, uh, you know, I've had children uh, pass away this year from crime in our neighborhood. And we have underestimated how important that is for the principal who is now providing stability, calmness, peace, moving the teachers and the students on, they need their own um, support, particularly that emotional support. So I've heard that. I've also heard from our principals in turnaround situations that while um, certainly additional funding, additional money, a different salary would be helpful, they also want um, to know that they could have additional funding to um, support and recruit and retain some of their most effective teachers. So while that would be helpful to them, and certainly I would promote that, it's also would they have a pot of money where they could say, I want to keep my most effective teachers here, and so this could be bonus money, retention money for them, or I could use that for some type of a recruitment mechanism for highly effective teachers. Um, because again, if they're a highly effective principal, people want to come work for them. 
but also they need to know that I want you here for multiple years and let's work out a system, whether that's a plan for you on how you're going to grow in your own teacher leadership or how we would create some kind of bonus structure or retention structure um, that would include funding or, or salary for them. And then I think the third thing I would add from a policy perspective is that we do need to continue to think about the lever that the state has to um, make sure that we have the most effective um, programs that are preparing future principals. Um, sometimes we don't talk about that, but the state has a very significant lever there. We actually do license principals um, to be a future principal. So what are things that we can do to ensure that we have the most effective principal prep programs across the state, and how can we ensure that they are being incentivized to have strong coaching, strong experiences in some of our high priority schools, as well as experiences in all the competencies that they're going to need to lead um, over, over we, we hope, is their lifetime um, as, as a principal. So I think those are some things that we are continuing to discuss, and we actually believe we'll be able to do some of those this year. So I'd love to just hear you all, Millard and Chris, and then Sonia, react to some of the ideas that Candace shared and some of the things that you all, that you struggle with that might need state policy levers. You have some uh, experienced state policy people and folks who can potentially even make some changes and decisions in the room. So what would you like to see? Yeah. So, so I, looking at all schools across the entire state or across the district as all being the same, is, is really a disservice because Dr. McQueen is exactly right. Uh, Murray County is unique in that we have all three subsections. I have inner city generational poverty, I have middle class suburban, and then I have rural schools all in one district of 22 schools. And to look at all of those schools as exactly the same and needing all the exact same resources, it d does a disservice to those principals and to those schools. Um, we have some schools that, you know, kids vacation in Florida and their, their, their parents go to California and some who came in and their uncle was shot the previous night. So, so how we work with our principals and how we support them and, and what we do for them um, is really different. And, and I think that's the way superintendents need to look at their individual systems as not as one entire system of schools, but these little, these little microcosms of our culture that the way you interact and the way you deal with and the way you work with principals has to be differently. Um, you, it's, I've got four girls. I don't treat all four of my children exactly the same. I, I, each of them has their own unique needs. They have the different way that they see the world. And so I have to react to them differently it's no different for, for, for principals in schools. There's going to be things that Sonia's going to need at Pearl Cone that Robin Wall would not need at McGavick High School, or they may. And so the more, the more you get deeper with relationships, with, with talking to principals, having, having sit down casual conversations in, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? And let's get past the platonic level of, oh yeah, things are great. Okay, that's good. Now let's really have a discussion. What's going on in your building? And when the principal really feels that there is, there is a level of trust, there's a relationship developed, they're willing then to share the real stuff that's going on. And so that happens with time, and with time comes trust. But when we talk about a principal moving every four to five years, when we talk about a superintendent, an average life as a superintendent is three to four years, you know, that's where the dynamic gets to be difficult. Because as superintendents rotate, principals rotate. So, so th th there has to be this, this conversation of stability and continuation, and I think relationship building. And I'd, I'd have to agree with Chris. Yeah. I think of it much like a classroom teacher would when we talk about differentiating instruction. Yeah. Uh, from, the, from the district standpoint as a superintendent, I try to take the same approach, and I would love to see that approach taken uh, from a policy standpoint uh, uh, the same way. I think we have to ensure that um, we understand, first of all, that we have these different sub-communities within our own school districts that may be miles apart or maybe blocks apart that look, you know, quite a bit differently. In Clarksville, where, where I am, you know, I, I have a, a university that, that, that has a, a housing project that sits right behind it. You know, less than a mile from that, you know, some of the uh, most expensive houses that, you, that you'll find in the area. So understanding the differentiation of what that looks like from a funding standpoint, uh, from a district standpoint right now, I have to uh, ensure that I take what I receive, you know, from the state or from the federal government and, and provide the necessary support and differentiate that uh, from, um, uh, from the standpoint of what it looks like. 
I think it would be great uh, for our policymakers to understand or, or look at it from a lens of how can we support school districts and understand what this differentiation look like, looks like and ensure that we provide the, the monetary support, uh, the uh, policy support, everything that's needed to ensure that, uh, that we're moving kids forward uh, at, uh, at the same rate. So we'll completely agree uh, from the standpoint of uh, that differentiation. Yeah, I, I'm, I might push a little bit and be a little more provocative. So my, my question maybe to the two of you would be, we, we actually do have the ability right now for superintendents to differentiate pay mm -hmm. for principals that are in various schools and to think differently, certainly about teacher compensation. And unfortunately, we see very few of our districts taking advantage of that um, because as you saw from the research that what we see is that our principals who are in a high poverty or low poverty school are being paid essentially the same. So while we have that ability right now for differentiation, we see very few districts taking advantage of it. So I think my question would be, what could we do to actually help take advantage of what's already possible now as opposed to think about something new and different, although I think to my point earlier, there are other things that we can do to add potential funds, to add other ways to support principal preparation. Yeah, and, and, and I love the fact that uh, Dale Lynch, head of TOSS, is here. I think this is the ongoing partnership between the Department of Education and TOSS to really educate superintendents across the state about the, fleet, the freedom and the flexibility that they already have. Um, what we do, we differentiate pay for teachers in, in our district. So one of the things that, that Aaron said is we have 96 instructional coaches. Well, those instructional coaches are current practicing teachers that receive money through the differentiated pay plan to take on three district initiatives of professional learning communities, project and problem-based learning, and using data to inform instruction. We currently have one principal that's on a differentiated pay plan because we're doing something different in that small microcosm of, of one community in Murray County. But going back to what you said, I, I think it's greater education among superintendents to really let them know the flexibility and freedom that they do have. And I, and I would love to see from the standpoint of, uh, we talk about staffing, and, and I've had the opportunity to differentiate uh, from a salary standpoint, uh, but from the standpoint of, of just understanding, um, you know, uh, funding dollars coming in, and of course Title I is a different support that allows for you to do some things for schools that, that have the struggles, that have the, uh, the, the higher free and reduced lunch uh, accounts, but I would love to see those, those BEP funds really focused uh, in and around what it looks like in terms of kids coming in the doors uh, with a free and reduced lunch count that, uh, that looks completely different. Um, again, title funds, uh, they do give you the opportunity to differentiate, but I would love to see that from a standard of VEP specifically. Um, but uh, I would agree uh, that there are those opportunities from, uh, from the standpoint of, of um, uh, the idea of, of, of staffing. And we're doing something a little bit different uh, this coming year. My, my chief academic officer and I have sat down and had some conversation. And he had an idea that, that I've actually practiced in the past that's going to allow us to do something uh, quite a bit different where we'll have lead principals in lieu of a, uh, an assistant superintendent. Mm -hmm. So we'll, uh, we'll take away or we'll have somebody retiring uh, as assistant superintendent or we call it something a little bit different in, in um, in Clarksville, but uh, it'll give us the opportunity to create a brand new pipeline for a wonderful principal like a, like a, a Dr. Stewart. Uh, so instead of her moving into an assistant superintendency, we have the opportunity to move into a lead principal's role that differentiates, you know, the salary by ten, twenty thousand dollars allows that person to continue to lead at a level uh, where they're building capacity of principals, but at the same time, not completely pull them out. Of, um, uh, of the building and uh, doing what they need to do with children. So that's a, kind of an example of what it looks like. But my, my focus in terms of my, my comments was more so around BEP, as, as complicated as it is, I would love to see that element of, of specific support for the lowest um, uh, achieving the, the highest poverty students. So in a minute, I want to get some thoughts, Jason, just on what this means in terms of research. But Sonia, give us a reality check, all the things that you just heard what works, what doesn't. Yeah, uh, so to speak to the last thing uh, that was said in terms of um, the lead principal, we've used that model here in the district. Um, I was, I had a, a lead principal that was my direct supervisor in year two. It actually, for me as a principal, was my best year feeling like I was in the work with somebody shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. 
and I can say at the same time that I have other principals who would not say the same thing. So I think it really, it really depends on the quality of that lead principal and their personal approach. When I had a lead principal, they were in my building more than any other supervisor I've ever had. They were there every other week. They knew my building far better than any other supervisor ever has. And because they were in the work, even though they didn't run the same kind of school that I ran, they still ran a school. And I think that that was enormously um, helpful for me. When I think about differentiation, which is what you, you've been talking about, for us in Metro, we have student-based budgeting here. And at Pearl Cone, we've had some grants along the way. And I can't tell you, one of the things I'm most proud of at Pearl is, is our teacher retention numbers. I mean, we have 57 teachers. We only, I only hired six new teachers this year. And you know the demographics of my school, that's really, really significant. Some of that is because I can differentiate with dollars, and I can also differentiate with the way their day goes. Some have additional planning for coaching purposes. Some get to coach alongside aspiring teachers. Some get to co-teach across humanities and different things where I'm able to create these learning opportunities within my building because of some funding um, flexibility that I have that retains these teachers over time. And so I, that differentiated approach at the school level with our teachers has, had, has been enormous for the retention of teachers in my building. And so the, all the things you just described, are those things that you just, you'd seen other places, you thought might work, you heard feedback from your teachers, what kinds of things gave you the ideas to go in that direction? I listened a lot to my teachers. So, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I have this idea, I have this philosophy that, number one, you've got, you, if you're coming to Pearl Cone, you've got to want to be there. We're serving the highest poverty kids. You're going to work more. You're going to work harder. It's, it's going to be hard to feel effective. So you've got to really buy into that. So that sense of vision was massive for us. But then as the teachers came on, it was, what do you need? What do you, how do you want to grow and how can I help you do that? Um, for us, the, our, my highest performing teachers, they want to feel like they have direct impact on what happens in the building. My leadership team has 25 people on it. They have voting power on budget. They have enormous influence of the decisions that are made in my building. And because of that, they feel like they are part of the change that they want to see within an organization, and they feel empowered. And so that's been really significant for us. Candace, I have a sense you want to make a comment, and then no, uh, and I, I, <laughs> amen, because that I mean, apart from the great research that Jason shared, I mean, she is describing what other principal research looks like: is right. that teachers stay because they do feel like, effect, particularly your most effective teachers are staying because they feel like they're part of the decision making. Yeah. And you noted this ability that Sonia has created to have some additional funds that she can use flexibly based on the needs that she sees with her principals. And again, I think that's very, very critical as we think about about retaining those effective teachers under the effective principle. So I want to open up for questions, and I know this crowd of people, so by questions I don't mean comments. I actually mean <laughs> questions. Um, so try, um, I'm sure there are folks who have some questions, and as we transition into that, and then we'll have some more conversation. Jason, any thoughts on all of what you've heard and how it might make you think about your research going forward? Well, I, I just sit over here taking notes, right? So I, I uh, you know, sort of, thinking about things that we are doing in Terra already, things that we should be doing at Terra. You know, I think um, we touched on a, a bunch of things. I mean, um, Candace talked about principal preparation. That's something we're, we're trying to learn more about right now. Um, I think, you know, connecting back to what I talked about before, I'm, what I showed you is that the, the best people stay, right? Good people stay mm -hmm. in the profession. And so one strategy for lowering uh, principal uh, turnover is get the right people in the job to begin with, right? Yep. So thinking, how, how we can learn more about how districts around the state are engaging in, in, with pipelines and placement processes and talking to superintendents and district folks, I think is something that we really want to do. And I think it's been really interesting that we've also talked so much about the idea of principal supervision and what's happening at that next layer up from the principal, um, because we don't think about that um, that often in, in education research. but. Um, the Wallace Foundation right now has this big, what's called a principal supervisor initiative, where they're trying to ex get uh, different uh, large urban districts around this uh, country to experiment with how they think about principal supervision and coaching and, and are thinking about things like stability and how people form relationships and how supervisors work with principals and so forth. Um, and I think we, there's a lot that we can learn about, what the, about what's happening in that initiative and bring here. Um, and, and coincidentally, Ellen Goldring, who's sitting back there, and I are the evaluators for that. So you know, we're starting to think about that as well, but I don't think about it as much in the context of the Tennessee work. I think about, I've, I've, I've you know, been thinking about that as something that is, oh, this little experimental, this, this initiative that this foundation is funding, and yet everybody up here is talking about the importance of pre, uh, principal supervision. It's making me think that's something that we need to be thinking about more in this state as well. So questions, and we have microphones. Renee? 
I know, I know everyone probably also has teacher voice, but microphones help with the <laughs> recording as well. Um, I, I've been thinking about uh, principal supervision today too, listening to uh, the conversation. And Tennessee has developed um, an instructional supervisor. Um, it's, it's not an evaluation system, but it is a, a rubric around which directors of schools or, or, or district leaders could um, think about the role of an instructional supervisor. Um, we have advertised that to districts through our flexibility survey for the last couple of years, but haven't gotten a whole lot of traction uh, in terms of its use. And I'm wondering, uh, particularly from Chris and Millard, what you're thinking um, might be some ways to um, kind of get some interest in that work. Um, what would be the conditions around which you would want to uh, utilize a tool like that in your district for feedback? Mm -hmm. so, so if it's not being widely utilized, I would say more education would, would definitely be, be the avenue to go, especially with, like for example, our assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction. That would be something like right up his alley that he would, he would need to know about because if, if central office supervisors are walking into buildings and providing high level instructional coaching to principals, are they being evaluated and observed according to that instructional leadership model to determine that, you know, there's one of us, there's six of them, there's 12 of them, there's 40 of them. How do we know when they leave our site that they're doing what we need them to do versus us finding out six to seven to eight months later or maybe a year later? So, so more education with those people that are directly directly involved, I think to me would be most beneficial. And, and I would agree, being new to the state, um, of course I have a lot to learn in terms of what's out there, but uh, what I have learned over the course of time in, uh, in three different school districts, having the opportunity with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, to develop uh, systems of support, uh, being a part of a fellowship uh, that, uh, that did just that, an organization called New Leaders, that uh, provided support uh, for um, uh, assistant superintendents, principals. Uh, I've kind of utilized uh, that over the course of my time to build what I imagine my systems and processes are gonna look like in terms of support. The most important thing for, for me in this work is consistency. Ensuring that uh, all of my assistant superintendents or, 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 or individuals that supervise principals are seeing the same thing. We need to be able to come back, to, uh, come back in conversation and ensure that uh, principal A through principal 40 are doing the same thing if they're not ensuring that the feedback that they're getting is, is, is guiding them in the same direction so that we eventually will see the same thing. So uh, I look forward, forward to learning more, uh, but with my work with McCrell and, and some of the other pieces of this puzzle uh, in terms of uh, leadership and support and capacity building, uh, I've been enthused with what I'm seeing, but I'm always game to learn more. <laughs> Questions? And, and I don't mean to totally Keep people from making comments, should there be important comments to make. <laughs> Nate, you have a question? Thanks. Uh, Nate Schwartz from the Department of Education. I'm struggling with what feels like a little bit of the contradiction between us wanting stability in the schools that need strong leaders most and the narrative that always comes around where a school is not doing well, let's change the principle first and everything mm -hmm. else will follow. Yeah. And I, I actually, I don't understand how we should be thinking about that, how long we should wait when a principal isn't producing results in order to, in order to see the improvements we want to see. Yeah. So Nate, I heard, I heard two different things. Um, uh, the, the, the placement of principals in, on the right seat on the bus, uh, and then the idea of whether principals should be on the bus uh, at all. And, and I'm one, it's, it's plain and simple. I think there has to be just as much support uh, for a struggling administrator, uh, but you have to f understand what that fine line is. In, in, in Tulsa, we, we went through this work. Um, I was new to the deputy superintendent's role and probably you know, uh, one of the worst guys in town when I removed 15 principals from the, um, uh, from the principal seat. And those weren't necessarily individuals that we moved back into assistant principal seats. Uh, there were people, I think 90% of them we removed from, uh, from the seat and, and from the district. But I think that has to be a stand that you have to take uh, you know, from, um, uh, from the standpoint of children and doing what's best for children. Um, so I think things in many districts have been done the same way for so long that it makes it extremely difficult to make a stand or to take a stand. But I think that stand has to be taken for children. And, uh, and it's extremely important uh, that 
uh, that we get the right people on the bus uh, from the beginning. You can't start the work and get the work done consistently at a high level unless the right people are, are, are on the bus uh, from the beginning. So I hope that answers at least a part of your question. Um, I think that just takes, um, that just takes a heart and, uh, and, the, and the understanding of, of doing what's best for children. So, and, and, and it can never be easy. And, and it's just one thing I, I heard Millard when, when he, I, was, I was looking at his nonverbals. A principal friend of mine told me one time, if, if, it's, if it ever gets easy removing a teacher, you need to check yourself. So as a superintendent, removing somebody, affecting their rice bowl, taking them out of building, upsetting their culture, should never be easy. But when you look at the continuum of John Cotter's Eight Steps of Change, towards the end, there is, there is the, 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 the earmark that says, do not be afraid to remove those harming the cause. Because while we want to think that, that all teachers are there to benefit all kids, all principals are there to benefit all kids, all superintendents are there to benefit all kids, sometimes we find in our case that's not the case. And some people are there to get a paycheck, or some people are there to make it to retirement. And so, so I think what superintendents have, have to do, especially in a, in a specific environment, a specific case, is look at all factors involved. But while you're starting to move through building the guiding coalition, getting those small wins, making those wins stick, you also got to look at don't be afraid to remove those harming the cause. Because there are... There, true, exactly. We do offset the data. We do. Um, but behind all of, that, all, that, all of that data are outcomes for kids and their students. So every, every single one of those numbers is, is a child. And so if, if, if you're uncomfortable removing somebody that's negatively impacting children, you know, that falls on our shoulders. And I do want to reiterate, I think, in those systems that you, you, you set up, there have to be systems of support. I, I don't want to sound yeah. like the Grim, Reap, Grim Reaper here, uh, because you have to have, we had a great support system in Tulsa in terms of what it looked like for a struggling principal to receive uh, capacity building over the course of time, over the course of that year. If they didn't meet certain uh, benchmarks or standards, then we moved in a, a completely different direction. So. Um, I don't want to, you know, be too left, yeah. uh, but you have to understand that uh, at certain at certain points, if, uh, if principals don't meet the benchmark uh, in terms of what's best for children, after that support has been implemented and given, then you have to pull the trigger in terms of doing what's necessary. Sonia, I want to make sure you get a chance to answer. Yeah, I think this is a really important question. Uh, I think for me, it begins with we have to be really honest about the amount of time it takes to turn a school around. And I do not think that we have a good understanding of what that takes. Uh, Pearl Cone, by all intents and purposes, would not have been considered successful into the end of year four. And at the end of year four, we had level five TVAS, one of only three in the city. That's all, that, all that's on that bio. We got that at the end of year four. How did that happen? One of the ways that that happened was to recruit and retain high quality teachers. How did that happen? To offboard people who were not and to develop teachers over time. And so I think we have to be really thoughtful about what development looks like and what amount of time. Uh, just, a, just an example, within our building, I had, a, I had a chemistry teacher who came in at a level one, uh, but his level one was growing. So you guys understand the metrics, right? And the state wanted me to remove him based on SIG money. And I said, fine, give me a, give me a chemistry teacher that's going to come to Procone right now and has proven data, because this guy right here is growing. He's not, we're not, he's not there yet, but let me tell you all the ways I'm going to support him. But, but unless you can give me somebody that's proven effective, I'm going to go ahead and hold on to this chemistry teacher. And I think we need to have the same ability to measure where we see growth over time. I think the other thing that, that has been really important in the Pearl Cone story is to look at the inputs that would lead to outputs. So is, is Pearl Cone retaining the high quality teachers? As Jason was really good at pointing out, if, if that's happening, then achievement is going to change. Then growth is going to change. Are kids coming to school more? Are discipline numbers going down? Is the staff happy? What does the culture and climate look like? And how long does it take to cultivate that such that the outcomes that we need are there? But I do want to agree with these two and that offboarding the people is really an important skill as well, right? So there are certainly teachers or principals who need to be offboarded in, in schools that are quote unquote underperforming. And I think that's a really important thing. But I do think we have to be really conscious of what scope of time it takes and how are we measuring the nuances of growth that are going to lead to those outcomes. Because again, it took us four years to get to what many would say was success. And there was certainly dialogue about removing me before that time for sure, right? And, um, and I think that takes, I think that takes um, some ability and some flexibility from the superintendent's ability or positions to be able to, to make decisions there. 
Kittis, I know you want to come in, and then Chris has a follow-up. Yeah, no, I would just say I know Sonia's story, and there was growth obviously happening multiple years uh, before she got to that fourth year. The, the culture change that was being created at Pearl Cone was, was seen. Right, so you do have to see what are the, the cultural things that are changing in terms of the school culture, the attendance, what's actually happening with retention of teachers, how are you thinking about the change, and how are you verbalizing that, communicating it, and bringing the community around it. Um, when you don't see any of those things happening, that's when you absolutely are going to have to make some type of a principal change. And the principal, by the way, the principal change in and of itself won't just turn around the building. That's potentially the start of that, but you have to have these other types of supports that we just talked about in place to really begin that turnaround effort, and that's what we're seeing from the research from turnaround in our state. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what, what we're also talking about is the difference between can't and won't. I can improve or I won't improve. Because something that, something that, that, that Millard and I keep, I know he focuses on and I keep, we keep it very close is, is you know, taxpayer dollars. Research says that when you let somebody go, 50% of human capital of their salary goes out the, goes out the door as well. So if, so if you're if you're paying a principal just a rough number, $50,000, and you let him go, you're actually losing $75,000 because you spent half their salary getting to, getting them to that point with training, with support, and, and such like that. So we've got we've got to keep that very close guarded as close to us as well, not guarded but close to us. Um, so so if you can't do it then I want to provide the level of support that you can get to get you to that point and continue to support and grow and support and grow, support and grow. But if you look at me as a superintendent and say, no, I won't do that, then that's a completely different conversation that, that needs to move forward from there. And what we're hoping is we want more people that say, I can't do it. I've actually had somebody say, no, I won't do it. But we want people to say, I can't. But I want to learn. But I want to improve. But, and then we give them what they need to get there. Jason, I'm sure from a measurement perspective. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking that for, for me, the partial answer to Nate's question is the, the district needs to be trying to keep Sonia Stewart at Pearl Cone, right? The, that, that's the priority no, no. And, the, shh, shh, shh. and the response. <laughs> <laughs> superintendent number two, she's already made her decision. Right. She's staying with superintendent number three. <laughs> but, but too often what we see in the data is that a principal who has success in a school all right, that we, we will see them move and we won't see them move into another school who needs that yep. great performance to turn that school around. We'll see, you know, that the, what, that where that principal goes is to a school who looks, you know, more advantaged than the one that that principal came from. And that's, that's the real worry that I have is that districts need to be thinking about, you know, the, uh, Sonia's great performance, uh, you know, the, 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 we need to set up systems where her great performance keeps her in that environment so that great performance continues, not let's you know let's move Sonia to some other school where you know oh she's done a great job let's reward her for that by that great work she's done by giving her an easy you know an easier assignment or something yep. like that uh, you know we want to create incentives for the best people to, to work with the kids who need the most and I think from a district standpoint it's something that really has to be thought about intentionally um, I, I call it bench strength I'm, I'm a, uh, I played college basketball uh, as well and uh, it was so important for that backup point guard to, uh, to be available, to be ready uh, for if an injury happened, if you know, uh, you get any injuries, uh, person's out for the rest of the school year. It's the same thing in the principalship. Something that we start, started to focus on in ensuring that uh, the strategic uh, focus in and around hiring our assistant principals was just that, just as important as hiring the principal and ensuring that that development happened as a part of the pathways and the pathway programs that we set up was important as well. Um, uh, talked about I was principal of the next to lowest performing school in the state. Uh, one of the most disappointing parts of my career was leaving that school after five years, uh, outperforming 85% of the schools in the state, and I left three years later. They're, they're back down one of the lowest performing schools in the state. So ensuring that that bench strength is in place and districts really rethinking that conversations around uh, that conversation around uh, what it is to ensure that we have strong uh, support systems uh, along the way in terms of the school year for assistant principals and what those pathways look like are extremely important.